it was not very practical to keep pouring it into the waffle iron. And he had a very good friend who worked with Booth Kelly in Springfield who said, I can make you on my press any kind of a pattern you want to. My dad, Pete Fetter, is the unknown soul in the development of Nike's Waffle Soul. Dad had the opportunity to be a part of something that was monumental in history, to help um, develop a product that was, was so unique, so revolutionary, that it redefined um, the running shoe. There's a lot of people that know, but uh, mostly just some friends and family. He didn't go talking about it to everybody, which is something that him and Bill were working on. There was a basically an ancient article written in the Nike Times uh, by Fred O'Neill, who was the research and development manager at the time. And basically, Fred had written that when Bill needed rubber, he went to the best he could find. When he needed leather, he went to, to the best. And I would really actually go on to say one more piece of that. When he needed somebody who could had the knowledge, the skill, the equipment to, to pull that all together, he found Dad. He gave Bill his time and effort and help when others weren't interested. My dad was interested in hearing Bill out. He had a press in his lab that allowed them to test various compounds under time and pressure. So Dad had a formula book that he kept that we had seen at home. And, you know, they would be trying various um, formulations of the waffle soles. Uh, there was a, 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 a plates that were made up. And then basically what they would do is they would be able to adjust the compound and then they would press that and create these two by two sheets. And, you know, he would at times bring the sheets home. They'd be, be in the back of his truck before he would either take those to either uh, Bill or to uh, Fred for, for placement on the shoes. And so it wasn't just the, the Oregon athletes that they were placing these on. We were also getting, getting some of these um, shoes that were in the process of being developed as well. I used to stop by every once in a while to visit him during the day at the lab. And uh, that's when I, I, maybe the second time I went in when they were making the soles, you know, they didn't do it every day, but um, I, they, Bill happened to be there, and that's when I, he introduced me to Bill Bowerman. And they would cut the sole out and glue it on the, the bottom of the shoes. They'd have a tennis shoe that didn't have any any tread on it or anything, and that, that's what they would do. The first ones were, as far as my, I, not my knowledge, it was done right there. There were other people in our family that know what Dad was doing because he put those black waffle soles on everybody's shoes. I mean, I've always known all along who, who that Dad was working with Bill on the waffle soles. I've always known, but there seems to be other people that don't know. And the city of Springfield was wanting to know, is this a myth, you know, oh, we can't verify it. So I just want to, to verify who the man was. Barbara Bowerman conducted an interview with Al Peterson of KZI. There's a couple important pieces of information that, that came out of that interview. Number one, she talks that, that Bill had a very good friend at Booth Kelly. Well, that very good friend had a name, and his name is Pete Fetter. The Nike company revolutionized athletic shoes by introducing a new sole that was lighter tougher and grabbed better than anything before. We've always heard that Nike began with Phil Knight selling shoes out of the trunk of his car in Eugene, but would it be more accurate to say that the company actually began across the interstate in neighboring Springfield? It certainly has been suggested. The story I've heard is that uh, Bill Barman had been doing some work in developing the soles at uh, his home and his wife at some point decided that her kitchen table wasn't the best manufacturing spot for this to take place and she suggested uh, perhaps rather strongly that he might move it to somewhere else. The story goes on that Nike co-founder Bill Bowerman moved his research to an abandoned carpentry shop at the Booth Kelly mill site in Springfield. 
People swore they'd heard this from Bowerman himself, but there was no official record of it. Bowerman died in 1999, and statements from Nike made the story sound very shaky at best. We heard back from some of the Nike senior management folks that that's not true. That's not where the birthplace of Nike took place. And so, you know, whether it's true or not, I don't know. I mean, With Nike denying it, the story began to sound like a tall tale, except for one thing. Bill Bowerman's wife is still alive and living in eastern Oregon, and Barbara Bowerman remembers everything. It was not very practical to keep pouring it into the waffle iron, and he had a very good friend who worked with Booth Kelly in Springfield who said, I can make you on my press any kind of a pattern you want to. So now we can place Bill Bowerman at the Booth Kelly site, but now we need to know something else. Did anything important happen there? The first solely made was a waffle pattern. But it was uh, perfected as he worked with man in the press at Booth Kelly. They perfected the size of those little squares of waffles. So yes, this was the beginning of the Waffle Soul series. This is the original concrete floor and foundation of the building where Bill Bowerman first perfected the Nike Waffle Sole. And when you think about it, it wasn't the shoelaces, it wasn't the uppers, it wasn't even the swoosh that made Nike the company it is. It was the sole, the distinctive waffle sole, and that sole was made here in this building in Springfield, Oregon. Residents of this city can now say that they did play a big role in the formation of Nike Athletics, one of the largest companies on earth, and they can say it as loud as they want. In Springfield, our town, Al Peterson, Nine News. If I never would have seen that video or heard Barbara mention what was going on at Booth Kelly, then I probably never would have said anything. So I was listening, I'm thinking, is she going to mention, I've never heard anybody mention my dad's name. So when I heard Barbara speaking in the interview, I was just waiting. She said, and he worked with a good friend. So I was waiting for her to say Pete Fetter, and then she didn't, so I was like, oh. Anyone who has ever put on any shoe that has a waffle pattern to it, owe it to two men, and that is Bill Bowerman and Pete Fetter. He needed to be acknowledged for all the time and effort, because, I mean, it wasn't like he went and helped them one or two times. This went on for quite a while, or several years, that he helped. You, you actually helped your friends back then, and you didn't expect to get paid for it. You just did it because it was the right thing to do. He didn't need the recognition. He was just happy to help, like he helped so many other people. He, he really wasn't looking for any kind of recognition. He was trying to work two jobs, basically, because he worked for me four hours every night. Plus, he worked eight hours for GP in the lab. And uh, he just, with three kids, he just didn't have a lot of money. You know, Dad had, had shared with me that there was an opportunity to buy in and that his um, opportunity to buy in was it was going to cost him $15,000. That was a lot of money back in the 70s. <laughs> they didn't pay him anything, but we got some shoes. Like we would go um, every year to, to the athletic department and uh, ask for the manager. My mom would ask for the manager, and then we would pick out some shoes. For helping, Bill set it up to where they could go to the Nike store and, uh, or the duck shop or wherever it was, and they could get shoes and stuff once in a while from Nike and uh, for helping. We were happy that Nike was able to you know, succeed and go on and become a, a big company that it is today because they employ a lot of people around the world. So that's a good thing. I don't have any um, goals or expectations other than giving the friend a name. Those are my only expectations is that he's, his name is known. Whether Nike puts it in the history books or not, to me really is, is not the, the importance, you know, because what we're going to do is, sharing his story will put it in the history books by itself.